morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone who are watching us from all over the world. We welcome you all to our Sunday podcast service. That's enough. That's enough. Milka, I have an exciting news to share. Wow, what's that? You know, I have lost my job. Let me dance. Kiran, wait. Why are you celebrating? How can this be an exciting news? This should be sadness for you. For me, this is a good news. Okay. Because huh? I am excited to see what God has in store for me and I mm. cannot wait to see where he is going to lead me. Milka, I believe in his promises. We see his promise in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Mm. Plans to give you hope and future. And I am excited about my future because God knows the best for me and his plans are good and perfect. I just have to trust him and not to worry. That's why I'm dancing and singing. Yes, you are right Kiran. As Christians, we should trust in God in all circumstances, especially in difficult times. I work in a hospital and hundreds of patients who are fighting with this virus. Many are dying, but many more are surviving. So brothers and sisters, maybe this pandemic has not treated you well. Many have lost their jobs and going through financial difficulties. So let us not lose our hopes. As scripture says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. So trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. So let's start this worship service with a prayer to the Lord Almighty. Most holy and gracious Lord, we thank you for your words which is life and health to our spirit. I trust that you are working behind the scenes for our good and I will hide your promises in my heart knowing that it will be well with me because you are good and faithful God. Father, I would like to pray for those who are listening to this podcast especially to those who are weary and burdened in the difficulty of their lives. Father, help them, take away all their burden and give them your peace. Father, help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you. We love you and we need you today and every day of our lives. Father, we thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And we want to submit this service, this day, and our lives into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So aimless, life filled with sin I wouldn't let my dear Savior in Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night Praise the Lord, I saw the light I saw the light, I saw the light No more in darkness, no more in night Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside Blind man that God gave back his sight Praise the Lord, I saw the light I saw the light, I saw the light No more in darkness, no more in night Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside Praise the Lord, I saw the light I was a fool to wander and stray Straight is the gate and narrow the way Now I have traded the wrong for the right Praise the Lord, I saw the light I saw the light, I saw the light No more in darkness, no more in night Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside Slap.
life is over I'll fly away To a home on God's celestial shore I'll fly away We're singing I'll fly away Oh glory I'll fly away In the morning When I die Hallelujah Bye and bye This life is gone I'll fly away Like a bird from prison bars is flown I'll fly away We're singing I'll fly away Oh glory I'll fly away In the morning when I die Hallelujah bye and bye I'll fly away just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away To a land where joys will never rain I'll fly away We're singing I'll fly away Oh glory I'll fly away In the morning when I die Hallelujah by and by
Let's remember the cross at this time. Violence, anger, envy, cheating, temper, rape, gossip, rage, lies. If you have a crowd of people involved in these activities what would you do would you want to associate with these people or stay away from them what if all the people around you were involved in hatred in fighting in sexual sin what if they were involved in, in corruption or cheating or just being envious of each other if all these were around you would you stay in the same place or would you want to move i know i would have a hard time living among such people but wait a minute i am not different i have been disobedient I have lied. I have got drunk. I have been immoral. I have lost my temper. So I am the same as anyone else who has committed all or some of these sins. And all these sins listed here are in the Bible. There's even evil thoughts. and greed and slander 
foolishness which I have not mentioned. All these are prevalent in our world today. And so if I am like this and you are like this and people around us are like this, who will accept us? Who will welcome us? Who will not count our sins against us? And that is where God comes into the picture. Coming down to our earth as Jesus. And showing us his incredible love. Blessed is the man who sin the Lord does not count against him. Love is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. God reconciling the world to himself by Jesus dying for us, paying the price and taking the punishment that we deserve. And now God can take us back. He can welcome us. He can hug us. We can be in his presence. Our sins won't be counted. God will not keep a record of all the bad we've done. It is forgiven. It is forgotten. What kind of God is this? Brothers and sisters, God has determined to love us no matter what. He has proved his love to us in Jesus. He will never ever stop loving you or loving me. The question is, will we stop sinning? Will we fight our sinful nature? Jesus overcame the world and he gives us the strength to overcome our sinful nature. God wants us back to be restored to him and Jesus fulfilled that mission. And now we remember Jesus, his body and the blood that was shed. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, there are no words sufficient enough to exalt you or to thank you for what you have done for each one of us. We are not worthy. And yet you decided to love us anyway. Give us the strength, Father, to live a righteous life, to love others the way you love them, to set an example for others. All things are possible through you. We believe that. Thank you for Jesus. Transform us and make us like him because you made us to be in your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We now come to a time when we take up a collection for the poor. There's a verse in the book of Proverbs that says, He who gives to the poor will lack nothing, but he who closes his eyes to them receives many curses. Do you know that God comes to you in the disguise of a poor person, maybe in the streets or in the train or in the shopping mall or in the bazaar or in the market. He comes to you disguised. And if you close your eyes to a poor person, then you are going to get many curses. But when you give to the poor, you will lack nothing. Brothers and sisters, just remember that the money we give goes towards helping the poor. Thank you for your generosity and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the way you blessed our lives and the way you take care of our daily needs. Help us to think of others who don't have what we have, Father, and be able to provide for them because it is in giving that we receive. And thank you for giving us 
our daily bread, shelter, clothing, but most of all for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Good morning friends. We are getting into the end game of this wonderful letter by the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia. I am sure we have been learning some amazing things for the last couple of weeks and that you are all super inspired just as I am by this letter from Paul. Now if you have missed out on any part, do not worry because all these podcasts are available on the same channel and you can always go back and revisit these at any point in time. So before we start, I hope you have the three essential items, a Bible, a book and a pen ready with you because this chapter contains so many rapid fire succession of thoughts probably because Paul understood that he was now coming to the end of his crawl and he wanted to fit in as much as he could at the end. Now just looking back at what we covered from chapter 5 last week, we learned about loving others by listening to them, by praying for them, by forgiving them. We also learned about how we need to serve and not bite which in turn becomes a proof that we are living a life led by the spirit which gives us the strength to do the right thing in every area of our life. And with this, let's jump into the final lap. Galatians chapter 6 and my first point for today is Restore the Sinners. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now some versions say, brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression. Now what is the difference between a transgression and a sin? What does it mean to be caught in a transgression? Transgression means to violate a known boundary, something you already knew. For example, when you tell your children, don't walk into the room with muddy shoes and they do it, they have transgressed. They have crossed the boundary. And Paul here, he's talking to a group of people who knew what they shouldn't be doing. He's addressing the group of believers here. And he's talking about a believer who violates something he understands and gets caught. And so Paul says, if anyone is caught in transgression, then you who are spiritual, you who are mature in faith, should restore him with sticks and swords. Right? No, Paul just in chapter 5 he talks about how legalism works. Now in a legalistic environment, people who are caught in sin are condemned. They are just thrown outside or stoned. But that is not what Paul says here. He speaks of a church that is governed by grace. Now when a church is governed by grace, you who are mature and you who find someone in sin, you will go to them to restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Why gentleness? Because that is how the Holy Spirit within us guides us to restore people. Paul talks about being led by the Spirit. Have you noticed how gentle the Spirit is with you when you act according to your fleshly desires or you are in sin? Now, There is no lightning bolt that strikes you down. You do not fall down to the ground dead. But your conscience tells you what you are doing is wrong. God is so gracious. He's ready to forgive us again and again and again. And it is His kindness that leads us to repentance. You know, oftentimes when we see someone sinning, we don't react this way. Some of us keep quiet and do nothing. Some of us might get angry and rebuke them harshly. Whereas some others just join them in their sin. So then, what is the right way to deal with sin in the church? Well, the right way to deal with sin is to follow this plan. 
Firstly, you pull the person aside. Second, you listen to them and understand why they did the sin. You know, many times we are quick to answer and rebuke even before the person can finish speaking. And finally, you use the Bible and challenge them firmly but rather sensitively. But we need to believe that people can change. Personally, I've seen a lot of people change if we can just listen to them. The person might just be in need of someone who can listen to him or her. And that might just encourage them and help them to change their life. And this is not just an encouragement for the one who receives the help, but it is also such an encouraging feeling to help others to change their lives. As we come to the end of verse 1, it reminds us that you and I are also subject to those very same weaknesses. Many times we forget this fact when we are helping someone out and we get into the situation thinking, I will not be affected. I, I won't be affected by all these things, all the sins that I am seeing. But now that is pride. And we need to make sure that we watch ourselves because even we are weak and we may fall. And then he goes on to say in verse 2 to carry each other's burdens. That if we bear with the burden of others, we fulfill the law of Christ. How? How is it in line with Christ's law? This is keeping in line with something that we learned last week. To love your neighbor as yourself as Jesus teaches in John chapter 13. And when we love other brothers and sisters, we are ready to carry their burden as well because we care for them. This morning, do you know anyone who is hurting? Anyone who is in pain or discouraged because of any particular reason? Reach out to them and help them. You know, maybe call them up and encourage them. Don't wait for others. You do something. You be the light in their lives. Point number two. Resist comparisons. Chapter 6 verses 3 to 5. If anyone thinks there's something when they're not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. You know, we all love to compare ourselves with others, to feel good about ourselves. And we have this natural tendency inside us, especially when we are helping someone out and we start to think, well, here I am the one who is doing the teaching or the discipling and he is the one who is receiving, which implies that I am more spiritual than he is, right? And Paul says, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. It's just a hint he gives us to tell us that we are all nothing in front of God. You say this to yourself, I am nothing. Say it again, that I am nothing. This is good for our humility. And he goes on to say, let each one test his own life, not look at other person's life and compare that with yours. He says, you look at your own life, how that is before God. You see, God doesn't grade on a scale and say that I think Joe was better than his neighbor Bibin when we stand before the judgment. Absolutely not. God's going to look at your heart and say, wow, he lived a righteous life. And that's why David says in Psalms chapter 139, he says, search me and test me, God, and see if there are any wicked ways in me. Don't compare yourself with others. Compare your life with the Bible. I remember comparing my life many times with my worldly friends just to feel good about myself and saying, you know, at least I am not walking around sinning like them. Remember that this is a trap from Satan to make us feel good, but rather imperfect before our perfect father. Now about carrying a load or carrying each other's burdens. Brothers and sisters, everyone in the church is different. Some are stronger than others, but everyone must contribute. Everyone must do their best and carry their own load. You imagine this. Imagine that a big pile of sand is covering someone's house and say probably hundred of us go there to help. Some Christians are big and strong like probably Bibin or Rohit 
and they can carry more sand but some of us are small like me perhaps or kiran and we can only carry a little but all of us should help move the sand now my question today is how is your life how are you doing in this area have you been carrying your own load in the church or are you just a passenger who just keeps watching and not doing anything are you helping someone today are you carrying your own load when it comes to giving your contribution or have you just been a spectator just seeing other people give how is your heart when it comes to bringing your friends to know about christ in studying the bible with people in encouraging others in serving have you been a contributor or are you just a spectator now think about your life for a moment and let us learn to resist comparing with other people point number 3 reap the harvest of good verses 6 to 10 nevertheless the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor do not be deceived god cannot be mocked a man reaps what he sows whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up therefore as we have opportunity let us do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers a quick comment here on verse 6 What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying everyone who's being taught by somebody you know at least hopefully you're taught by someone and he's reminding the believers to share all good things with the ones who feed them. Now who are these people who feed us? Could be our mentor or our instructor or even another disciple. You know, isn't that cool to be able to share insights with them? Now let's come down to verse 7. Now this is a common reminder about a spiritual and a physical law and this law is no different from the law of gravity a thing drop from a height it will fall to the floor it's something that will certainly happen and that's why Paul says do not be deceived because it cannot happen any other ways he says if i sow to my flesh I can expect to reap to my flesh. What does it mean to sow to my flesh? It means that I follow the inclination of my flesh. For example, if someone does something that makes me angry, I become angry. That's following the flesh. If I keep getting angry at small things, it will lead to bigger and more alarming things slowly and steadily and I won't even realize that. But Paul He adds a good side to it, the positive side. He says, if you sow to the spirit. Now what does that mean? It means if you follow the inclination of the spirit, which is life and peace and forgiveness and joy and patience and the other fruits that we listened to last week, then you will reap from the spirit even until eternal life. And by this, he does not mean to say that we earn our eternal life by f- following the life of the spirit but rather he says that by sowing in the spirit we will reap things in the spirit that will be seen on the last day when Christ returns he's telling us that sometimes when we sow we might not see a quick harvest and we might have to wait long you know maybe until Christ comes back again which is why paul says let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up why do we get weary of doing good these days it could be because no one encourages us because none of our visitors are becoming christians you know maybe because people criticize us or because we have money problems or other problems that are worrying us or our our family is negative about the good works we've been doing or it could even be because no one thanks us or appreciates us for the good works we do how are you feeling in this area this morning are you feeling weary about something 
if you are then do not give up because we will reap a harvest no don't expect to reap all those spiritual blessings right here right now all of it might be reaped much later but it's difficult for us because this generation of ours we are into instant gratification like instant coffee or instant tea it's easy we want to get things done right away and when we don't see the results we start to compare and say well look at my friend he doesn't even believe in god but look at his life how happy he is how he has the most luxurious house the best car and everything else and look at me here i try to be spiritual i try not to fall into sin yet god is not listening to my prayers well then do not give up continue doing the right things continue doing what is right in front of god and we will soon reap a harvest moving further what is verse 10 say it says do good to everyone both believers and unbelievers but especially to the household of believers why because their family and also jesus said when we love the family of christ the world will know that we belong to him that's one way people will know we are followers of jesus by the love we have for the family how are you doing in your love for one another you know we cannot just say that we love a person and not show it in our actions i really appreciate brenda sister and she is someone who i really look up to she follows up with people she knows who need the rations she helps out with the women and even when she is discouraged she never gives up and she is someone who whose works go unnoticed someone whose works don't come out in the light even then she continues to do good things because for her her love of giving is greater much greater than the appreciation she would receive so brothers and sisters let us not grow weary in doing good continue doing the right things continue doing what is right in front of god and you will soon reap the harvest of good my final point for today is really change galatians chapter 6 verses 11 to 16 see what large letters i use as i write to you with my own hand those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything what counts is the new creation peace and mercy to all who follow this rule to the israel of god from now on let no one cause me trouble for i bear on my body the marks of jesus the grace and grace of our lord jesus christ be with your spirit brothers and sisters amen and that's the end of chapter 6 Now let's get back to verse 11. What is Paul trying to say here in verse 11? He says, "See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand." In the middle of such a serious conversation, why is he trying to put his focus on something he is writing with his own hands? You know, it's like he stops writing for a moment and he looks at what he is writing and he says, "See what large letters I use." funny isn't it so this is what is happening most of the times paul did not write his own letters he dictated them to someone who wrote them for him but towards the end of each of his letters he would write a small portion of it with his own handwriting and he would call their attention to this handwriting because that was the mark of authenticity that it was actually from the apostle paul to tell them that the letter is not a forgery because there were already letters circulating that were said to be from the apostle paul but were not so he calls their attention and the fact he writes with such large letters probably he had some serious problems with his eyes you remember in the beginning of the letter he tells them that it was because of a disease 
that he came to them in the first place and that when he was with them they treated him like an angel like an angel of the lord and that he tells them you love me so much that you would have got out your own eyes and given them to me if you could so paul might have had some problems related to his size which is why he wrote in large letters and after he says this he once again makes a reference to those false teachers who are trying to get the christians to be circumcised and follow jewish law of the old testament they were teaching all the christians should become circumcised and these false teachers they wanted to brag about how many brothers they were able to get circumcised they wanted to boast about this means they were looking for a trophy or a prize so they could boast about it but paul however he wanted to boast about something different he wanted to boast about the cross which is why he says in verse 14 may i never boast except in the cross of our lord jesus christ now what is paul saying here he's saying that the jewish teachers want to boast in your flesh because that's what you can do they want to boast in what you can do to be saved or what you have done to be saved but you know what paul says here he says may i never boast in anything except in the cross of our lord jesus christ because now i'm boasting in what he did and not what i can do you see the difference that's what galatians is all about it's not about boasting in what you can do to be saved or how good you were because we can't be good enough we only can rest in what he did on the cross and boast in the cross of jesus christ and paul says that through the cross the world has been crucified to me and i to the world it meant that the world meant nothing to him after he became a christian what does it mean to crucify the world in our life it means to deny the worldly desires it means to love the lost it means instead of following the lust and the greed of the world i am going to follow my lord jesus christ the cross of cross cross of jesus christ crucifies us to the things of the world and as we come down to verse 15 he says if you've been circumcised or not that's not important what is important is if you're born again that's the new creation he talks about what does it mean to be born again it means when you and i when we receive what jesus did on the cross and we accept his payments for our sins the bible says his holy spirit comes to live within us and we're given that new birth we're born again and it's not something we can do but it's something he does through his spirit when we receive him as our savior when we really change and are born again we are new creation it's like the old person has died and a new one has been born in its place try to recollect some of the ways that you have really changed since becoming a christian i remember my life how my life was before i became a disciple life was just messed up you know i remember how i used to get angry for even the silliest of things i would not want to obey my parents i would cheat in exams i would tell lies and telling lies had just become a normal part of my life and i think god has just picked me out from there and called me out to become a new creation it's not something i could have done but it's something he did something my father did through his spirit when i received him as my savior friends i have a question for you Have you received Jesus as your savior? Means do I believe that what Jesus did on the cross was personally for me? Do you believe that? You know as we continue further in verse 17 Paul says he bears on his body the marks of Jesus. Now Paul here he's not bragging about the persecution he went through. But the Greek word for mark could be translated to the English word brand. The slaves got branded and brand signified ownership paul is saying let not anyone cause me any trouble because i have on my body the marks of the ownership of jesus christ for paul all the physical marks on his body because of the stoning the shipwreck and other persecutions was like the authenticity 
of his belonging to Christ. And finally, Paul concludes the letter by saying, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. So, in conclusion, what are some key points we learned this morning? Firstly, to restore the sinners, reach out to them with gentleness and be a light to their lives. Secondly, to resist comparisons. Let us not compare our lives with other people, but instead compare our lives with our perfect father and say, I am nothing. That will help us to be humble, to, to stay humble. Thirdly, reap the harvest of good. Do not be weary in doing good to people. Continue to do the right things and you will soon reap the harvest of good. And finally, to really change. You know, I'm sure it has been a wonderful experience feasting from this letter to the Galatian church. Remember that there is no other gospel other than the one preached to us. We cannot add anything to this, nor can we take away anything from this. But sadly, many churches today, they change the gospel for their own needs to make it look more attractive. But the gospel, it is as raw as it is. And finally, don't forget that salvation is a work of grace. You cannot earn it, no matter what, because we have no merit. No charity or attending meetings or preaching or singing or helping the poor can get us justified because if you're trying to earn your salvation, then there was no need for Christ to die on the cross. Christ did it because we couldn't do it on our own. We should be doing good works not to get saved, but because we are saved. Now, if you're not a disciple of Jesus yet, reach out to someone who can help you. Someone who can help you to study the Bible and know more about the God of the Bible so that you can be a new creation and be changed forever. But if you've already been transformed by the cross, brothers and sisters, I urge you to hold on to it because none of our works can justify us. No act we do can ever make us righteous before God. And the only thing, the only thing that will justify us is the cross to remain and to hold on to what Jesus Christ did on the Mount of Calvary 2000 years back for you and for me. Amen. To God be the glory. Wow. What an amazing end to an amazing letter. You know, what more can I say? You know, let's just thank the Lord, you know, as we bow down our heads and pray. Let us pray. O Lord, God of infinite wisdom and knowledge, who is also the source and summit of all that is good and holy, we praise and thank you for this wonderful letter that you inspired Paul to write by the power of your Holy Spirit, that your saints for all generations can be encouraged and challenged by it and also that we could do a series on this letter. God, we pray that this series wouldn't just remain a series for us, Lord, but that we would make an effort to practice all that we've learned from this letter. Give us the grace to do that, Lord. For your glory, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So before we end the podcast for today, let us have a final song. And I would also like to remind you that this Friday we are going to have a quiz on the book of Galatians. So I hope that you are prepared. And I will be seeing you next Sunday, same time, same place, right here on YouTube. Until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Amen.
Yesterday, no morrow, but one eternity.